Well, welcome everybody to Startup Grind Chilliwack. So Startup Grind is part of a global network of chapters. There's more than 550 of these worldwide, and it started in Silicon Valley. And Startup Grind Chilliwack is one of those, and so we're interconnected with this entire global community. Really, there's three parts to it. Make friends, give first, and help others. Three simple values. And as you're networking and meeting people, keep that in mind. Say, how can I help you? How can we work together? How can we collaborate? What can I do for you? We've got three wonderful sponsors this year. SEPCO, the Chilliwack Economic Partners Corporation, Accelerator, and the University of the Fraser Valley. Let's hear it for our partners. <laughs> and on the partner level, we've got Cowork Chilliwack, Currency Marketing, Wisebox, and Around Chilliwack. Let's hear it for our partners. And if you are taking photos or tweeting or Snapchatting or whatever you're doing, use the, the hashtag Startup Grind, and that'll roll up into the global Startup Grind community. So it is a great pleasure to announce our guest for this month is Raymond Zabata, the president and CEO of iOpen Group and the chair and CEO of Accelerator. Let's give a warm Startup Grind Chilliwack welcome to Ray. All right, so we had a, uh, a pre-meeting over beers on Friday, and I, I find these pre-meetings just wonderful, because I think I know the person, and like I said in my email, I, I really only know about 5% of their story, and I think you do too, even if you know Ray. First up, I want to talk about early life in Calgary. Uh, you had mentioned that your parents emigrated to, to Canada. Tell me about that. First, they landed in, in England, and then they obviously, through the, uh, through the relationship between Great Britain and Canada, they ended up in, in, in Calgary. Hmm. Um, this was around the, uh, the late 50s time frame, 59, 58 to be exact, I think. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I grew up. Went to junior high, elementary, high school. Uh, didn't quite make it to high school. Did, I think did one week of... of uh, of uh, high school and dropped out. Hmm. And your father, he was an auto mechanic, right? That's right. Yeah, so that, it wasn't really an entrepreneurial upbringing, was it? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, I mean, um, you know, as, as we shared, we, uh, in, in our pre-interview sort of uh, uh, discussion, we, you know, we had lots of challenges. I had lots of challenges with my, with my parents. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a tough combination when kids grow up in in Canada and and you have uh, parents that are from another country, you know the cultures and the values and everything they clash, right? Mm. So so you actually left home around 15, right? Yeah, I I've made my first exit uh, at the age of 15, uh, and. <laughs> um, you know, and, and unfortunately, uh, however, fortunately, I, I learned a lot through my experiences. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not for everybody. Uh, and not everybody survives the streets. But uh, definitely for me, uh, it, it was, a, you know, it was an eye-opening experience. And uh, got kicked around pretty good uh, on the streets. Uh, hitchhiked pretty well most of North America. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, once again, from city to city, you're just kind of looking for things to do, get in trouble. <laughs> what people do at, uh, you know, teenage years. So, hmm. But that wasn't the end of your education. You got back involved, and I understand there was a mentor who, who played a key role in your early days. Yeah, so, um, you, you know, through the youth ministries and so forth, I... I ran into to, to Joe, who was the individual that you're referring to, uh, took me in, um, gave me a bed um, in a basement. This is at the, around the, I was 18 years old, just going into me, my 19th year. Um, and um, yeah, so he asked uh, if, if I would uh, uh, be... Um, interested in working with him. He was an auto mechanic as well. So I got into auto mechanics and started out uh, being a grease monkey and, and uh, changing tires and so forth. And that was where, where sort of an epiphany for me 
was that, you know, in, in the streets of Calgary when it's snowing and slush and uh, you're sitting under a, a, a hoist and uh, stuff dripping down your neck and so forth and you go, boy, I think I need to do something better than this. Um, so that was, was my um, um, sort of a, a time to, to get back and, and uh, um, get an education. So literally did not even uh, finish my high school till I was 20 years old. Um, and, um, so what does that look like? Are you doing it by correspondence? Are you going to an actual classroom? Or? Yeah, no, it's AVC, and it's, it's, it's for those that are from Calgary, by any chance, you know, the Alberta Vocational Center. Mm. Uh, so I did my first uh, uh, few courses there, but they provided, as an adult student, you could actually transfer your credits to the, the local community college, which at that time was uh, Mount Royal College. So I transferred my courses to Mount Royal College and um, um, had an aspiration uh, to go into medicine, so uh, enrolled in, in biological sciences. Hmm. So I did two years of biological sciences at Morrow College, and then I transferred to University of Lethbridge. And the reason I transferred to University of Lethbridge and studied University of Calgary was because I sucked at math. And <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even pass the, the high school math. I think I tried three times, and I just couldn't do it. So, And at University of Calgary, the requirement for medicine was you had to have calculus. And I said, I can't do this. Hmm. So I, I transferred to University of Lethbridge. And you finished a degree there? Yes. Yeah, so and, and in third year, I knew this is not my career either. Um, there's no way I'm going to be able to, uh, to get, uh, y you know, 90s and 95s in, in every single uh, course. You know, when you start talking about biochemistry and, and biogenetics and that, that's pretty tough to get those kinds of grades. So, but I had to finish. I mean, I, I put myself through school, working in nightclubs and, uh, and so forth. And wow, what an experience that was. I think John <laughs> knows what that's all about. <laughs> so, um, but, um, but it pays the bill, right? Work construction in the summertime and, and uh, you know, work, uh, work nightclubs. What was your biggest takeaway from going from the streets, essentially, applying yourself back into school and completing a degree? That's a huge accomplishment. Well, I, I think there's many takeaways, but uh, I think the most important one is is that y you know it, you you have to stick to it. I mean, you have to you have to understand that um, you know education is is key. Um, I've always said this, and I think it's my staff uh, heard me say this that education didn't teach me a lot about the discipline that I'm in right now. Obviously, I'm a totally in in, in right field. Uh, with, with the tech sector. But what education does teach you um, is to exercise your mind, uh, to be able to do research, to be able to do, um, you know, apply yourself in, in certain way. It's exactly the same way, as I, and I've heard, been heard saying this before many times, it's like going to the gym. And in, in the gym, you know, you have to learn not just strength and conditioning, you have to learn balance, right? And, and school teaches you discipline and balance and, and that. So that, was, that mm -hmm. was my takeaway, that you have to stick to it. And a lot of people fail at it. A lot of my friends that I went to, to school with, they, they couldn't finish because, um, you know, they, they just, and, and I'm going to be absolutely right, they just had it made too good, right? The parents right. are paying the bill and, and we go. But, you know, when you're working construction and you're working nightclubs and you're up till three in the morning and then you got to go to school, right? You got to finish. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you learned research and this was pre World Wide Web, I would imagine, where you're going into the library and, and tell me about your first business idea that came out of that. Yes, that's pretty interesting. I still remember this like it was yesterday, but um, so I finished school, you know, thinking I have a degree and I'm going to go and apply for a job. But I, at that time I knew that business is where I was going to be. Um, so one of the, the easiest positions in, in a business world is, and, and it is very, very uh, um, competitive, but 
and for that reason it's easy to get into, is to become a leasing agent. Go and work for um, a developer and, and start knocking on doors and, and ask uh, commercial tenants, are they ready to renew their lease and things of that sort, right? So I said, I'm going to go and apply to Cowley and Keith, and some of you in the room that remember Cowley and Keith, that was a big um, real estate company. And I cannot forget what Dave Cowley said to me. So I walked in, just imagine, I walked in wearing a pair of dress pants, suit jacket, and cowboy boots, right? And he said to me, he goes, son, you're a bright guy, but first advice, get all your cash ready, whatever spare change you got, go get yourself a proper suit. You're never going to, nobody's ever going to hire you if you don't have the proper attire, right? And I thanked him for it, and I, and I learned. And, you know, I, I think... Yeah, you know, attitude is, is very, very key in, in, in business. So, you know, so here I am getting kicked around. Nobody wants to talk to me because I got a degree in biology. What do you know about business, right? Uh, we got guys that are, are economics majors and finance majors applying for the same type of positions that I'm applying for. So coming back to education, what does it teach you? It teaches you research skills. So... I rented a room from a lady that I was working in a nightclub. She was the bartender. I was her helper. And I rented a room in Forest Lawn, Calgary, which is one of the worst neighborhoods that you could ever imagine. And, um, and I asked her, I said, can I rent a portion of this kitchen from you? Uh, and she said, why? She said, well, because I just want to set up a fax machine so I can send and receive faxes. And because uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to research and see if I can start a business because I'm not going to get hired here by anyone. This is six months being literally, literally six months, nothing in my pocket. And um, so she said, okay, um, you can do that, $25, because I pay the tellers bills. So anyway, long story short, I got set up. And I went to University of Calgary, took two buses um, to get to university, and as you said, back in those days, there's no Google, right? So, so opening up the book. So long story short, I realized very quickly that at that time, the government were subsidizing Korean immigrants um, in order to get their visas and immigration status. Uh, you have to have X amount of dollars to come into the country, get a business started, hire a certain amount of employees, and then, um, you know, meet your requirements. And... What they were doing, and they're still doing it. This is mind-boggling. They're still doing it um, to this day, where they come in, they buy a grocery store, they hire a couple of employees, they run their two years program, and close it down and uh, meet their requirements. And, and their main criteria is, is quality of life for their kids. They want their kids to be educated in North America, right? So long and short, Research is telling me there's a ton of Korean immigrants coming here, but they're opening garbage businesses. So I came up with the idea and formed a company called Can Global Business Consulting. What do I know about consulting? But what I did know, once again, is research skills to figure out what does it take to properly open it up and set up a business, right? How do you incorporate? How do you, you know, set up the share structures, all that stuff, right? That's just... It's knowledge. It's there in the library. If you, if you work at it, you go to the city hall, you, you ask your question. So within the first year, I had set up 12 corporations for Korean immigrants. How did you get your first client? That, so I found that there was one um, common denominator for all these Koreans that come into Calgary, and that was an immigration consultant. So I knocked on his door and I pestered him till he said, okay, you know, let's, let's just see, you know, I've got this one guy coming, coming in, his name was Mike Kin. Um, my stepson is in the audience here, so he knows what I'm talking about. Um, and we opened up for Mike um, an or organization. So anyway, first of all, yeah, so that was the, that was the venue. So I, I got in and, and he introduced me to a bunch of his clients. But first, he introduced me to Mike Kim. And we opened up this little billiards place called Chalk and Rack, which is in Northeast Calgary. Um, and 
you know, he had never thought that for the amount of money that he was investing, he was going to get such a business. And it was a huge demand for that particular um, uh, idea in, in Northeast Calgary. So there right? must have been some language barriers, even trust barriers. How did you overcome that? Well, well first of all, so the word gets around because, th right. th you know, this is this guy is doing something and, uh, you know, and, and they're a very close-knit community, so the word got around. But the trust factor is all, Koreans were all about, you know, relationships. If any of you have done business with either the Koreans or Japanese, they're all about relationships. So they would invite me to dinners. They literally became, you know, family members, and I still talk to some of them to this day. Hmm. Um, so the, the trust is not easy, obviously, because, you know, they're feeling uncomfortable, they're in a new, but they're also realizing that I'm making their life easier, right? Right. And, and they're not just throwing their money in the garbage, they're actually getting a feasible business. So 12 corporations in, in the first year. So during the run of that business, was, was it you as a solo entrepreneur? Did you hire some staff to help? No staff. It was just yeah. me. I rented, I rented a car from a buddy of mine, Rob Cusack. He had this green hornet, old VW, sitting, <laughs> s sitting in, in, in the driveway. I gave him $50 a month to rent that car. And, um, you know, so it was just me running around. Hmm. So that was your first business in Calgary, and you went on to found a couple more, I believe. Tell me about that. Yeah, so my college buddies, um, they, you know, noticing my success, I was doing really well. Um, so one of my friends, who is a dear friend to this day, um, Dave, came to me and said, uh, you know, he's an MIT graduate. Um, so he said, you know, my, my mom has left me a bunch of money, and uh, I, I'm thinking of opening a business, um, you know, and I don't know how to go about it. So long story short, um, I communicated to him that, you know, to, to grow a business, to start a business like that, you're going to, you, you know, we're talking all of a sudden now uh, enterprise scale clients uh, on the IT side. Uh, that's not easy. So he said, well, let's, uh, let's see what's on the market. And you know, we just came across this this dying company. The owner, Jim Finney, was about 64 years old at the time, and he was ready to, to call it in. He would have closed the business if if we hadn't made him an offer. Um, so that was that was Finney Taylor Consulting, which is still alive to this day, multi million dollar corporation. So uh, stop there for a second. That's a really interesting concept. So rather than you and your buddy saying we're 50 50 partners and we're going to put a flag in the ground. You, you thought to go find an existing company with an existing client base. Uh, did you give thought to starting your own thing, or was that just sort of a no-brainer to you? Well, that was, for me, that, that, that was probably, you know, semi-fluke, semi, you know, kind of instincts mm -hmm. that this is going to be very hard. Um, but, y you know, I, I think it was, it was a combination. Got it. Yeah. And so you formed a partnership and bought that with your buddy's money, essentially? Yeah. Good. Nice, yeah. Well, nice no, work. No, I, I, no I, I dropped, I dropped 10 you, grand. Okay, I you dropped. had some skin so, in the game, yeah, too. Yeah, so, so think about it. 1991, I'm flat broke, and now I got you know, money to throw into a company, right? Right. Um, so I put in 10, he put in 40. So he brought the tech acumen, you brought the business experience no, he and didn't sales. have the tech acumen. He just was a good sales guy. Okay. Yeah. You said MIT. Was yeah. that... Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. it. So, um, so away we go, right? And uh, the, the good thing about Finney Taylor at that time was um, that it had some good, good clients. Um, but here's where entrepreneurism kicks in. Okay, we got good clients, and we're, we're, we're you know, um, uh, we're off to the races. Uh, I'm on the business side. I'm managing the funds. I'm managing the operations, uh, hiring a few people here and there, firing a few people. So that's what I'm doing while he's out there pounding the streets. Um, but but the, the, the funny thing is, is that... Um, not a one of us really know anything about IT. I mean, he, he's an IT graduate, but not in a practical sense, right? 
Um, well, you say MIT, and that goes a long way, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It shows on his card and, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But it was the, it was the reputation of Finney Taylor, right? We would not communicate that Finney, Jim Finney's gone, right? Like, we just say it's <laughs> Finney Taylor, right? And, and it, was, it was his name in the oil and gas, because, you know, oil, oil and gas is pretty tight in, in Calgary. Mm -hmm. So we had Anderson Oil, right? Like, they had some good names. They were going, we're, we're on to something, right? Um, so so it, it took off, and we started to get some contracts. But it was a recruiting firm, really. It wasn't even really an IT company. It was a recruiting company that did, you know, recruiting for the, for, for the IT sector, but it did do some project work here and there, too. Okay. Yeah. So these big oil and gas companies needed IT expertise, and you guys had a line on that. And, yeah. And where did you get your candidates from? So... You know, that, that, was a, that was a tricky part, right? Lots of advertising in, back then in those days in the newspaper. But once again, one of the, the things that, was a, 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 the, that proved to be catalyst was that Finney Taylor had a good reputation for all those years. So they knew, you know, that it's a, it's a company that's been around for a long time. So when we advertised, we did get lots of candidates. And you started a, kind of a sister company partway through Finney Taylor? So, so that's where the, the true sort of, um, you know, as I alluded to entrepreneurism comes in to say, okay, wait a minute here, guys. Like, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. We're paying these consultants. All we're doing is, is, is hiring and firing people and bringing people in. And, and, you know, what if we were to actually manage some projects and, and bid on some of these projects and then bring... We already have a contractor database, right? So what if we, we put this together in a way that we can actually start to, to bid on some of these projects and, and make some serious money? So in 1994, we launched Intersight Corporation, uh, which was strictly a project management company. So we coexisted with our sister company, Finney Taylor, uh, across the hallway and Intersight Corporation, which I started all on my own. So Dave... My friend was not part of that because he felt that it's too risky. We're never going to pull this off. Um, but I went for it. And uh, Intersight Corporation did really well. Uh, and, and for those of you techies in, in, in the room, if you recall, Oracle, SAP, PeopleSoft coming into the, into the world, and they're transforming the non-relational world to our relational databases, right? And that was our sweet spot that we hit on that we would go to companies and we would sell our expertise a as far as, as be able to convert their databases from a non-relational database to a relational database. Hmm. And somewhere in all of this activity, you've got two businesses running. You got a job offer somehow. Tell us about that. Yeah, so, so um, I was in Seattle um, and we got our first major client, Labor Ready. Uh, and I think some of you are probably familiar with Labor Ready. It's a, it's a national uh, U.S.-based organization. They weren't in Canada back in those days, but they are now. Um, but they were looking for a portal for, um, the, for applicants to register. It was an application, a uh, web-based application. So I went down to Seattle, and I got that contract. Um, but while I was down there, I attended a conference, and the... I ran into this guy, his name is Nick, Nick Parikh, and, and he was a senior vice president for CDI Corporation. And CDI is, is a multi-billion dollar Philadelphia-based uh, institution that um, essentially were looking to migrate from an engineering-based um, consulting company to IT consulting. And Nick just took a liking to me, and he just said, you know what, you've done some great stuff, and this is totally up, our, uh, up your alley, and, and we're looking to open a Bay Area office. Um, you should come work for us. Um, that dialogue went back for probably a couple of months. I mean, here I am. i got two companies. This guy is, is hot on a pursuit here to, to, you know, get me to open a, a Bay Area office. So, and, you know... Those of you that have heard, before, uh, heard me speak before uh, know that I have always said, you know, the reason the brain, the brain drain happens is because either one, it's because of glamour, and two, because of the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. 
And they were both there for me. I'm going, wow, right? Like, this guy is going to pay me some huge bucks. You know, it's Silicon Valley, right? And if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut my teeth on some real business, that's where I got to go, right? And being the real entrepreneur, you figured you could do that and keep these two other companies yeah, exactly. going, right? Yeah, well, how exactly. did you? How do you relocate to San Francisco area? I mean, there's got to be visas and applications it involved and sponsored. Like, yeah, it was a nightmare. What uh, did that feel, and what, what was the simple steps you took or the complex steps to make that happen? Well, well the first thing is, 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 you know, as you said, I, I had to figure out a way. How do I keep these things going and go down there and do what I'm asked to do? Um, so that took a little bit, and, uh, you know, but I had a key person on the inner site um, uh, company. Uh, I had a key person, so I kind of delegated to him. And obviously, Dave was running Finney Taylor, so that was not an issue. Uh, I um, I literally severed my ties with Finney Taylor, cashed out, uh, moved on, and but I kept the Intersight organization going. And uh, 1984 Concord, Chrysler Concord, loaded up, headed for the border. And this was around what era? 1996. 96. So beginning of the gold rush, the dot-com boom yeah. is coming. My car is loaded. <laughs> like, it, you can't see out the back window, right? <laughs> so there was no problem there. They just ushered you right through, right? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the funny thing is, three days later, I crossed the border. Every day I was on the border, the guy, and I remember his name, Mr. Lydell was the inspector at that time on the, cust on the customs. And, and so I crossed Sweetgrass, Montana border, right? Um, so that's a challenge right there. You know, you got a bunch of rednecks looking at you like, oh, Canadian coming in to take our jobs. No way, right? So he keeps me on the, on the border all day. And this is no lie, folks. Five o'clock roll down, Mr. Lydell will come out, off you go, go back, go back to Canada. So at okay. this point, did you, did you have like a formal job offer that someone was yeah. going to be sponsoring Everything you? Everything was there. Okay. Was just playing games. Hmm. Everything was there. Go, I need this document, this document. So I'm up till midnight, one o'clock in the morning in a hotel room trying to duck, you know, line up my ducks for the next day. Three days that happened, folks. And on the third day at around 3 p.m., he lets me go through the border. So the jalopy makes it down through yeah. a number of states, and, and you... Anthony was uh, Anthony was uh, five, no, six years old. Okay. And uh, Brendan, which is my youngest, was only a year old. Wow. And so you planted there. You guys went to school there, obviously. And and what was the first year like? Well, the first year was really challenging because you know here you are in in the Bay Area, your your rents are, and this is this is kind of the a little bit of a um, clues to my later conversation as to why I felt the similarities between the Bay Area and, and, this, and this region was it was so expensive, $3,500 for one bedroom apartment uh, in, in, in the Bay Area, right? I was in Sunnyvale, California. Our offices were in Santa Clara. Um, so it was really challenging to be able to meet, you know, make ends meet, keep the operation going back in, in uh, Canada, as well as run at full house, two, you know, uh, three boys all together, my ex, uh, and had a house that mortgage and all that. So it was pretty tough for, for the first year. But I did break into some very, very big accounts, Visa International, Wells Fargo, Lockheed Martin, for CDI Corporation, and they just loved me. And, uh, and what did CDI, what was their product offering? Well, basically, they, they so, if you recall Intersight Corporation, basically they did the same thing ex except at a very, very large scale. They would bid on project. We were called ambulance chasers. And what that meant, wherever Oracle and SAP sold, we were there because there was disasters, right? Because if anybody knows, if you buy SAP, you know what it stands for? Sell me another product. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, <laughs> you, you know, so we were called ambulance chaser because we would go, if KPMG Consultant is going to do this for $2,000 to implement this a day, we are going to do it for $800 a day, right? So, so, but we did break these accounts, and which was, which was very good. Hmm. 
And so your CDI run, how did that come to a close? So, you know, first of all, uh, just to mention, I had to close my operations back in, in Calgary because mm. it was just too hard. It, it, it wasn't working. I was losing money to keep the staff going. I was actually working there and sending money back to keep these guys employed. So I shut that down. So that I just wanted to, to mention that. But, you know, two years go by and, and uh, my family's not with me. Uh, you know, flying back and forth once every two, three months um, sort of thing. And, um, you know, you got to remember I had a one year, you know, when I left a year old boy, right? So that's hard. Mm -hmm. But um, keep going. So two years later, CDI gets management change at the very top level, and they decide that they're not going to do the IT stuff in the, in the Bay Area. So I got my marching orders, and they said, you know, um, great job, great reference. But So the funny thing is, I used to call on, on a client of mine with Fujitsu Software Corporation. His name was Ray, too. Um, and uh, so I, I said to Ray, I said, you know, we had lunch with him. I said, I got to go back because they're closing shop. He says, wait a minute here. You're not going back. He says, you just come see me in the morning. I'm going to introduce you to HR. Um, and so you were like the virtual LinkedIn before there was a LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, <right>? yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You just, I mean, you, you have to get in the car, right? Like you have right. to get in the car and you got to go visit people all day. That's, mm -hmm. that's what we did. Put on a suit, tie, and, and away you go, right? Hmm. So Ray made you a job offer. Well, Ray, yeah. So it wasn't for him, but it was in a, in a different division. So Fujitsu Software Corporation never sold software on North American soil in 1998. Um, but they had this huge monstrous product that came out of Japan called Inter Interstage. And Interstage was essentially, for those of the techies in the room, is, is a direct competitor to WebSphere and WebLogic. So it's an application server technology. Um, so anyway, Interstage is being launched in the US. They said they needed a person that would literally support um, the sales staff and writing presentations, but it paid pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, $75,000 US, it's pretty good. Um, so I started the job and within literally nine months, I was the unit manager for Interstage. Mm -hmm. and and did you find your experience working with Korean immigrants helpful in, in navigating the foreign company you're working for? And was that all part of it or just kind of a natural people person? Well, I, I, seriously, it, it was because I, I'm, and a lot of you know me in this room, I'm a bit of a pit bull. So I just went after things <laughs> and, and I would just, I would just, I would just sign up and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, and they just went for it because they just saw the energy. It was hmm. just the energy. And were you flying, like you were based in Silicon Valley, but the mothership is in Tokyo probably. Or were yeah. you going back to Japan for meetings? And Yeah, once a quarter. The, so the brutal part about that job was the, the, the travel. So think about it. Fujitsu, and there was a term that they used to use in, in North America. It was called ROW. So you had every, everything in Japan, and then they call everything else ROW, or rest of the world. That was their philosophy, right? So think about it. So I had a counterpart in, in Sydney, Australia. I had a counterpart in Dublin, Ireland. And so this is when I became the unit manager, the head of the business development for all of Fujitsu software in, in North America. And um, starting in, in San Jose, direct flight, 16 hours, Sydney, Singapore, Shin Yokohama, Japan, Dublin, Ireland, back to US. That's once every three months. Three. But in between that, your clients, because we were after the big financial s s companies, Citibank, Chase Manhattan Bank, Bear Stearns, Fidelity. So you're literally in Boston, New York, Dallas, you know, San Francisco. Hmm. That was the beat. Wow. And meanwhile, kind of the consumer web revolutions coming up, I guess you were pretty much immune to that in that enterprise space? Were you aware of the Googles and the Yahoos and kind of opening up that space? Not really, um, because remember, we're, we were in the space of enterprise application integration, 
enterprise data integration. Um, so the Googles of the worlds were never really on our radar. But what was really exciting was, and, and I can say this, that we were the first five companies, Fujitsu was, that adopted RIM or BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. We were the first five large organizations. Sun Microsystem was another um, Fujitsu, and there's a few, few other, but five altogether. Uh, in the U.S. that actually adopted uh, BlackBerry. So I can say that I was literally one of the first BlackBerry users, and those that know me, I was using it till last year. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And your Fujitsu run, you did that through 2000, up to early 2000s? No, it was uh, it's mid-2000, mid till 2006. Got it. And at some point, you decided, family and everything, that you were going to come back to Canada. Yeah, so it was it was a it was a it was a challenging time once again. So my family eventually came to, to San Jose, uh, and we lived there. But um, my ex just absolutely hated um, the the Bay Area um, because you know Bay Area is is for business, right? There isn't really. I mean, it's not it's not Cal it's not L.A. It's not San Diego. It's it's San Jose, right? Um, so she didn't like it. Um, so long story short, she took off. But her friend happened to move to Abbotsford from Calgary. And she just came here and said that, you know, and here I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Case closed, drop Case the mic. <laughs> Well, so you land in Abbotsford. At that point, you were still doing your Fujitsu job, right? Yeah. They so allowed this is you to... 2004. Got it. We actually um, loaded up the truck for the, what, sixth time hmm. um, and, and moved to, to um, Abbotsford. Well, actually, my first house was in Mission, um, across the street from Golf Course in, in Mission, um, up the hill. And um, I was commuting for two years to, to the Bay Area. So I'd get on a, get on a plane Tuesday afternoon and come back Friday night. Sometime, you, you know, maybe extend it over two weeks and, and so forth, but mm -hmm. usually I'd be back home by, by Friday. Well, and you coming from that experience, you were saying that at that point kind of a light bulb was going off looking at this new area you're living in, paralleling with what you were doing there, and I've got a, um, you thought that there was really a regional tech opportunity, and Ray sent me this slide, which was a, from a presentation deck that he made to SEPCO, with a MapQuest uh, um, screen grab yeah. <laughs> talking about the similarities. Yeah, so, so if you look at this screen, so, so first of all, um, two years, I'm flying back and forth. Lots of time, the plane doesn't land on time, and it's circling. And, you know, I just, I'm, I'm going to myself, first of all, the economic similarities, right? Um, the the cost of, of living is just exploding in Vancouver, and... You look at the so you look at the economic similarities, and then you look at the geographic similarities, and it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this map, I've you, actually got another one which kind of draws the parallel for you yeah. uh, of our valley as well as the Bay Area. So you got but, two sides of the water dividing. Uh, if you go back to mm -hmm. that, you you know you got two sides of the water or two sides of the water dividing the the valley. Um, you got towns all the way. Around. If you look at the arteries, exact same amount of highways feeding back. You look at the uh, train system that runs uh, on the other side of the water. Uh, if those of you that are familiar with it, BART or Bay Area Rapid Transit System. But the funny thing is, if you look at these, if you look at these bridges, there's your Mission Bridge. There's your Golden Ears. You got the the, the gold or the uh, Golden Gate and the Lions Gate. You got Sausalito on the other side, North Vancouver. And you look at the entire Monterey Peninsula, which is kind of where we're sitting as far as the quality of life and lifestyle is concerned. And, you know, it's amazing. And you can even see the names. And I talked to a demographer back in those days to qualify. But a lot of the ideas, um, the, 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 the rural ideas for, for development and uh, economic development, uh, as well as the geographic development, came from the Bay Area. I mean... You, you look at San Francisco, always had and thrived uh, the biggest Chinatown in, in North America. Well, we have the same, right? Um, so that's where the idea started came. But not because, you know, I look at the map and go, oh, this could work. No, we did a ton of, and when I, when I um, 
The next slide to this one, which mm -hmm. you don't have, um, I actually presented why it makes sense. And it was all about the cost of living, cost of doing business, and I was adamant that tech was going to become one of the biggest economies in the province of British Columbia. All sort of pointers to that direction to say tech was going to become very big. So, and if the cost of doing, where are they going to go? They're going to go out, you know, in, into the valley. So today, if you look at San Francisco greater, you know, you're talking probably close to 2 million people. You look at the valley east of San Mateo, it's 6 million people. And guess what? Final, San Jose International Airport, if you look at the old picture, it's almost identical to the Abbotsford International Airport 25 years ago. Before we move on, I just want to pause and, and thank Aiden for Ray going rogue and actually capturing him in the, in the uh, frame. So let's hear it for Aiden there for a second. Sorry, Aiden. <laughs> That's all right. Like I said, you're going to have to keep up. So this was a, a sure passion area of yours that you're kind of presenting to economic development um, departments and... I got and, laughed at. Yeah. And, but you founded, uh, with some other partners, something called SRC Tech... And I believe that was in 2009? Yeah. yeah. So I started my evangelizing in 2007, <laughs> um, but it took me two years to, to actually convince a bunch of people to come and form a board and, and form a you know, formal organization that then started to really go after um, municipal and, and provincial and, and actually even to the federal government to say they, they need to start taking this seriously because this phenomenon will develop, and it's important. So on the personal business side, uh, had you wrapped up your position with Fujitsu at this point? What were you doing? Yeah, so I, I left Fujitsu twice, to be honest with you. Yeah. First time I left because I got so sick and tired of crossing the border and giving me hassles over my visas and so forth. And they said, oh, you know what? Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, actually, no, sorry. First time I quit when, when my family moved out here, and they said, no, don't quit. As long as you're close to an airport, you can do your job so we can fly back and forth. Second time I quit because of the visa situation. And I just said, you know, uh, and they said, oh, no, no, we've got a company in Toronto called Object Star International. We just payroll you through there so you don't need the visa. You just work, uh, f you know, uh, officially you're working for them, but technically you're working for us. Um, so I did that, but yes, in... in 2006 time frame, then I, for the last time, I resigned. Got it. And you were taking the train into Vancouver for a different job? Yeah, so a, a small company uh, that was a startup came to me and said, um, y you know, we got this concept, uh, building a, a, an application for the telecommunications and the utilities industry. Um, we don't know how to get this thing off the ground. Uh, so they hired me as, as vice president of sales and marketing. Um, we did a, they didn't even have business card logos or anything. So it's literally like about a bare bones st startup as it gets. So Kinetics Wireless, two, um, uh, three, uh, three owners. Um, anyway, uh, we made some, uh, we, we broke a few accounts like Terrison, uh, BC Hydro, um, started to take off. Telus came in, um, made us an offer. Um, these guys were such boneheads. They didn't, they didn't listen, um, and uh, this, there was something funky in the background because Telus asked to, to, to look at the books, and they wouldn't disclose the books. And as soon as mm -hmm. that happens, you know, they're gone, right? Thank you. And I said, oh, my God, I just spent two and a half years, almost three years, take this company from here to here. You got millions of dollars. I had quite a bit of stock in that mm -hmm. company, right, as a sign-up. And I just said, that's it. I'm never doing this again, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that's when we started... Uh, so SRC Tech 2009, 2010, 2011, I was planning to, to build iOpen Technologies. Got it. And so tell me about founding iOpen Technologies. Yeah, so iOpen Technologies. So I always had the, the, the company um, incorporated back in, in Alberta. This was supposed to be my next company, and it literally sat in, in Shell for... Um, so, by the way, iOpen means... I is for the internet or web technologies. Open is not because it's open, it's because open standards. 
everything to do with compliance and standards. So that's what iOpen technology stand for. So I had this vision even before I went to, to California. Was gonna, after Intersight Corporation, I was going to launch iOpen Technologies to do a lot of software and, and data integration projects. So it sat in the shelf. So I picked it back up, flipped it over to BC, registered it, and uh, away we go. Hmm. And tell me what, I know I've been told this numerous times, but geospatial applications and development services. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> okay, so, you know, obviously, spatial technologies have, have come a long way. So in 2011, when iOpen um, got back on tracks and, and started to, to market its services, um, all municipalities uh, are dealing with GIS systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, the, the challenge with municipal government is, is that the financial system does not talk to, to uh, engineering, engineering does not talk to um, uh, public, uh, public works, public works, to, so they don't, they're all working in these silos. So long and short of it is the idea was leveraging GIS system to take them beyond GIS, to actually provide a geospatial platform that allows them to integrate so you can get a centralized view of all data, all work, all personnel through a single platform. Got it, I think. 30 <laughs> seconds. There you hopefully go. You, hopefully you got that. And so, boiling it right down, there's mapping involved? And are you pulling that Everything from? Everything has got a spatial attribute, spatial um, you know, component to it. Got it. And these are open databases, or what are you pulling from? So, so the, the, the beauty about what we've developed, so in a company like iOpen, there's two sets of IP. People often confuse the subject of IP with just technology. Well, it's not just technology, it's methodology, okay? So think of this as a mechanics um, shop. You are doing the physical work to pull the transmission out, but you gotta go to the workbench to grab the right tool to be able to allow you to do the job, right? That's the methodology piece. That's the, so there's two sets of IP. How you integrate data, whether that's spatial data, and, and our claim to fame literally is the ability to integrate spatial data with non-spatial data. Now that's easy said, but that's not easily done. It's very, very hard. Hmm. Um, so we developed in parallel these two sets of intellectual properties, one is on the methodology, one is on the technology. And your clients are primarily local government? Uh, they were in 2011, okay. primarily government. Uh, because one of the easiest institutions to work with, if you can get in there, it's not easy to get into municipalities, but once you get in there, they're not concerned about developing IP or, or worried about what, what you're gonna do if they pay you to do a job. Uh, you know, what are you going to do with that IP? Whereas private institution will always want to know, wait a minute, we're paying you to develop this. Are you going to resell it? Are you going to resell it to our competitors? Whereas municipalities will go, sure, if we use it, give it to our neighbors. They can use it, right? So they're very, very uh, open to that mindset. And this is, this is why we targeted the municipalities, because to build these two sets of intellectual properties, we have to, to, to be ensured that we're not going to have IP challenges. And I imagine your experience selling into Wells Fargo and Citibank and massive corporations served you well to navigate that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, was on, I was on the phone between 60 to, to 90 calls a day calling municipalities. It's not easy selling into municipalities. I've been swore it. I've been told to F all, you know, this. But it, it is what it is, and hmm. that's what it takes. It, you've got to do dial for dollars. So in parallel to this, this is coming, becoming a going concern, and meanwhile your passion project, SRC Tech, is also growing. What, what services did SRC Tech offer at the time? Well, so SRC Tech was very conceptual. Literally till 2015, it, it literally was conceptual. It was just beating you know, beating down the pavement and going and trying to get governments to, you know, the SEPCOs and the economic development offices to, to listen to, you know, that they should take techs as serious and certainly in the valley uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. So there's really not much happening between 2011 to 2015. Um, but in 2015, 
uh, Andrew Wilkinson, who um, is going to be running for Liberal um, government there or for, for the next uh, uh, elections. Um, so I, you know, he was the Minister of Technology, so I, I asked, you know, I got a meeting with him, I hounded him, and I got a meeting with him. And, uh, you know, literally, um, to, to make a, sort of a, a, a lengthy discussion short, I, I just said to him, I said, can you just tell me why not? Forget about why, why not? Um, and I was starting to get to a point where I was talking to the media and, and speaking about why the government is not listening. Um, so he had to pay attention. Um, and so he said to me, and he said, Ray, well, how do we do this then? I said, well, this isn't that hard. You look around you, you've got three industries in, in the valley. You've got agriculture, you got manufacturing, and you've got aerospace, right? Um, so, and look across the border, ag tech is really taking off. And you guys, sh you know, you're literally sitting in, a, in the ag capital of Canada. Why aren't you thinking about, oh, hey, what does ag got to do with technology? Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. So anyway, he says to me, he goes, Ray, why don't you go and, and put a proposal together? I said, wait a minute. I got three companies. I'm not doing proposals. Fork up. We'll hire a consultant. They can pick my brain, and we'll do a proposal for you. So we did that. It was actually Chris Bush's friend, Hallbar Consulting, that, that we um, got some money for to do the to do the uh, to the proposal, and uh, lo and behold, they they funded us uh, you know a couple million dollars to go and launch the and they can never take that away from us. <laughs> um, launched the first ag tech program in British Columbia, um, and you know we've put through forty seven entrepreneurs through our organization. That says a lot. Hmm. Cool. And so that brings us to the present. Uh, you've had a bit of a pivot from SRC Tech to Accelerator. Uh, tell us about that. So the, the, the challenging part that I identified was that they gave us the money, but they fed us stuff that I felt is just not working. And what I mean by that is that we had lots of ag tech entrepreneurs coming through our program but we're putting them through Venture Acceleration Program, which is uh, part of the, the, it's a methodology for the BCAN or, B, or the BC Acceleration Network. Um, and it's an old haggard training course. And I felt, wait a minute. This is the same concept as, as if you look at a university. University pumps up students, but they don't guarantee them jobs, right? I said, this is the same thing that's happening. And, and if you talk to, our portfolio of companies, they will tell you, they were so frustrated that they would go in, they would do the three-week program, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the challenge is not about teaching them how to be entrepreneurs. I mean, that is part of it. But then what, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest challenges are related to um, growth capital and talent. And, and that's where you run into snags. I mean, we went through the same thing. Uh, iOpen has grown through, you know, leaps and bounds. There's two people that started that organization back in 2011. But, but that's not an easy thing to do, right? Um, so, so I said, we're going to put a new face on this, where we're going to be all about building companies, creating jobs, and investing in futures. And how we do that is through providing capital solutions, solutions that will make a difference for capital, for skill, technical training, and, and, and education. So this was late 2018 when you debuted the new brand. You've now hired a, an essentially an executive director or a lead on that. Can you tell me about that hire? Yeah, so, so I've volunteered a lot of my time uh, for Accelerator um, to, to consult with some of the municipalities, and, and we did get some consulting dollars for that. So that allowed us, I mean, this is, once again, folks, Accelerator is also a startup. Think about it, right? So we deployed the same methodologies, we generated some funds, we put the infrastructure in place, we put a great brand in place, we did the marketing, we did the, the profiling, uh, but now it's time 
to leverage some of that cash to invest in, in, in bringing somebody full time um, and generate sustainable, a, a sustainable organization. And you're going to see through uh, the, the media and the press releases that are coming out in the next little while that we're launching a number of different programs mm -hmm. that will allow Accelerator to, 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 to go on forever. Um, and, and self-sustain without having its hand open to, to, the, to the government for funding. So that's our plan. We're going to do the same thing that we've done with all other companies that, that I've built, the same methodology to become a fully functional staff, infrastructure, and uh, self-sustainability. Awesome. Great. Let's hear it for Ray.